We want to remind our listeners that this program is for informational and educational purposes only and not intended to substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The Animal Medical Center does not recommend or endorse any products or services advertised by SiriusXM. Welcome to Ask the Vet with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. This is the place to talk about your pets and get advice with a top veterinarian from the Animal Medical Center in NYC. Hear from the leading authorities on animals and give us a call to ask your questions. Now, here's your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today on Ask the Vet here on Sirius XM Stars Channel 109. I'm your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus, this week and every week. I'm a board certified internal medicine specialist and cancer specialist for animals at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center right here in New York City, where we're broadcasting from. We're the world's largest not for profit animal hospital. On today's show, I'm excited to be talking with Jessica Mejia a licensed veterinary technician at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center and AMC's 2022 Technician of the Year. Jessica is gonna give us some insights into the important work performed every day by veterinary technicians around the country and some changes she's seen in veterinary medicine over her long career here. Later on, I'll share some important and timely pet health information as well as interesting animal stories. So I'm hoping you're gonna stay tuned for a great show. For my new listeners, did you know that Ask the Vet is also available as a podcast? That's right. Thanks to our partnership with Sirius XM Radio, Ask the Vet podcast is available on all major podcast platforms. So I hope you'll like and follow us to stay up on the latest animal news. For 112 years, the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center has been keeping families together by providing the best care for pets possible. Now, later in the segment, I'm going to take questions from our callers. So if you have a question about your pet's health, just call and leave me a message on our toll-free voicemail, and I'll answer your question on next month's Ask the Vet show. I'll give the number again later in the show in case you don't have a pen or pencil, but if you have one right now, that number is 866-993-8267. And now for our trending animal of the month. It's time for the internet's most talked about animal. This story comes to us from England about a 15 year old tabby cat named Larry. Larry the cat happens to be the official cat at the British prime minister's residence, number 10 Downing Street. Larry holds the official title of Chief Mouser. His key responsibility at the property include inspecting security defenses and contemplating a solution to the mouse occupancy of the house. Larry has outlasted four prime ministers. That's right. When Larry the Cat's Twitter account proposed him as a candidate for the UK's next leader, it blew up. And pretty soon people were posting signs that read, Larry the cat for leader. Larry announces all the important news from 10 Downing Street, and only yesterday he announced the arrival of a new DOG. That DOG belongs to the prime minister and is named Nova, a red Labrador retriever. Well, Larry's steadfast tenure at number 10 Downing Street has led to an enormous loyal following among British citizens, actually, and a lot of other people, because I am not a British citizen, but I do follow Larry. And across a recent video propelled him across the globe. In the short video clip, Larry the cat is seen in his usual post in front of number 10 Downing Street when suddenly a red fox approaches. Larry wasn't going to let this fox get in the way of his duties, and he jumped up with all his might and chased the frightened fox down the street and away from the prime minister's resident. This is absolutely a must-see. Just Google Larry the Cat chases a fox at number 10 Downing Street to watch Larry defend his territory. And now it's my pleasure to welcome my colleague, Jessica Mejia, to Ask the Vet. Jessica is a licensed veterinary technician at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center and in 2022 was named AMC's Licensed Veterinary Technician of the Year for her exceptional care, compassion, and collaborative spirit. Jessica's worked at the Animal Medical Center since 2000 
or translate that to 22 years. During that time, she's worked in a number of positions at AMC, including emergency service, internal medicine, surgery, and in our intensive care unit. Currently, she works as the lead licensed veterinary technician and coordinator for AMC's interventional radiology and endoscopy service. In this role, Jessica develops patient-specific anesthesia protocols for interventional radiology and endoscopy procedures. Jessica also assists with all aspects of patient care from admission to discharge and participates in research and educational products. She also serves as an AMC preceptor, having trained more than a thousand licensed veterinary technicians. Jessica, I'm so glad you can be here today on Ask the Vet. Hi, thank you for having me. I am honored. So I just want everyone to know that I can see Jessica because we're, we're recording this over Zoom. And so Jessica has on the best surgery hat you've ever seen. Thank it's you. got black paw print band that holds it on her head. And then to contain her hair, there's a poofy top that's <laughs> multicolored and is absolutely adorable. Thank and you, she's. Thank you. It, this is not a fashion statement for Jessica. She's uh, coming to us from an empty operating room where it's quiet and peaceful. And so um, if you're in the room, you're wearing one of these hats because we don't want to contaminate the OR. Yeah. So, so a little bit of an unusual um, uh, interview location for today. I think the first one coming from an OR. I so, like to keep it different. <laughs> So I want to start with the most important question of the whole interview, and that is talk about your pets. My all my pets. Well, I have six animals at home. I have three cats and I love breakfast. So I decided to name them waffles, pancakes and omelet. And then I also have three little dogs that have a Pekingese captain. I'm sorry, a Pekingese monkey, a French bulldog, Henrik, and a Chihuahua, Captain Crunch. They're, yes, they're definitely all breakfast items. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> and where did they come from? How'd you get so many? I believe it or not, got them all from here at the Animal Medical Center, except for one. One ended up adopting me. And she decided that she was done walking the street and parked herself in front of my door one day and said, this is my home and I'm going to stay here. So she stayed there. That's Pancakes, the cat. She was just a stray. She was a stray. So AMC is not just for the public out there. Don't start calling the Animal Medical Center wanting to adopt dogs and cats because we're really not an adoption agency. But every now and then something gets abandoned here. And then a lot of times a staff member like Jessica falls in love with the patient and ends up taking them home. Yes. But we AMC takes care of sick dogs and cats. We are not an adoption agency, although every now and then we kind of fill a little gap right there. So let's, let's go back to the beginning of your journey as a licensed veterinary technician. How did you get to be a licensed veterinary technician? Um, so I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do after I was done with high school. And one day I just happened to be going over a catalog from LaGuardia Community College and I saw that veterinary technology was offered and I loved animals. I have always loved animals, but I didn't know that was actually available. I didn't know that was, I could work with animals in a medicine setting. Um, so I looked into it. I applied into the program. I got in and that has been, I have never looked back again. I've done it since. So. Why do you think it is that people don't even know that a job like you have exists? Well, I think 22, 23 years ago, it wasn't as popular, but I, now it's more known that we, we can give medical care to animals the same that we do with humans. So it's, it's, I think it's more popular now than it was 20 years ago when I first started. So how's the, so Jessica went to LaGuardia Community College, which we can almost see if we look across yeah. uh, the river from the Animal Medical Center. So is the class of, of technicians bigger now than it was when you went? I think they it is. I think um, I, 
yeah, I think more people are interested in being veterinary technicians than they and, were years ago. So they've increased the class size to help meet demand. Yes, I think so. So there are veterinary technician programs all across the country. Um, the next closest one to us, do you think is Farmingdale? Do they still have a program? Um, Out on Long Island? I think Long Island University has a program now. You're right, it does. Yep. Um, Mercy College has a program. Oh, that's probably Rochester. the next closest. Yeah. Um, and, and I think there's one in Dale High. Yep. Yeah. So close to the Animal Medical Center, there are those programs. But these veterinary technician programs could be at, at some schools offer a four year degree. Yes. Um, and and then sometimes they are at community colleges and it's a two year degree. So if any of our listeners are interested, they can probably Google veterinary technician program, veterinary technology. Do you know a website where they list all the programs? I don't know. There's, there isn't one, I don't think. So you just got to Google veterinary technician programs and then a bunch of different links will come up. What the other question I have is if veterinary technician, licensed veterinary technician is a term special to New York state. What are the other um, titles that people might have that would help them to Google a little bit better? I think register veterinary technicians. Yep. Um, yeah, I've heard that one. Veterinary nursing is starting to become more and more popular. Um, but I feel like those are the main two, the licensed veterinary technicians and the registered veterinary technicians. I wonder if you Googled certified veterinary technician, maybe something would come up. Maybe. Too. Yeah. Um, I mean, I haven't looked into it. <laughs> well, no, because you're already licensed, certified, yeah. registered, whatever it is. But just to help in case we have a listener who says, oh, geez, Jessica's job sounds great. I'd like um, I'd like to do this, too. We'll give them some uh, direction uh, as how there's an forward. online program. I'm trying to remember the name of the university that offers it online. Uh, I think I Purdue. I can't. There's a different one. I think it's, it's a Phoenix, maybe. I think there's more than one yeah. online program, actually. So that's a, that'd be another thing for people to investigate is if there's not a veterinary technician program near you you might be able to do a good chunk of it online and, yeah. and so there's a lot of opportunity right now and a lot of really good jobs in veterinary technology very good jobs nowadays and you can do anything from being a startup technician to doing managerial stuff if that's what people want to do well and then then it's not it's take care of dogs and cats but some technicians do large animals they do large animals they do exotics like birds ferrets, rabbits, um, bearded dragons. Some people work in research. Yes. Because you need veterinary technicians to take care of the, the, the rabbits and mice and guinea pigs or whatever the research animals yes. are. So that's another opportunity. Some veterinary technicians teach. Yes, they right? do. We, we have, you and I have some friends who, who are on faculty at universities yeah. that teach people to be technicians. I, I think that veterinary technicians have as many job opportunities as, as veterinarians do right now. There's lots of stuff you can do. A lot of stuff out there. So in 20 years at AMC, uh, what do you think has changed? What's the biggest change? At the AMC? Yeah. Um, I feel like as a technician, I have a bigger voice now than I did 20 years ago. I feel like a lot of doctors trust me enough to come and ask me for my opinion, uh, ask me about different protocols for anesthesia, for example. So I feel like our voice as technicians have gotten louder and in, in a way that has changed as a field overall, not just here as, at the AMC. Um, at the AMC, Nothing really much has changed. I feel like the medicine that we have practiced has always been amazing. And it just keeps getting better and better with the advances in human medicine. We are also collaborating with human doctors a lot more than we used to, uh, which is great. Like in my department, for example, we have doctors from different hospitals around the area that come in and help us do procedures and help us provide better care. So I feel like that has changed a little bit for the better. 
and and things like equipment like Right now, I'm looking at my anesthesia machine, which is probably worth $30,000 that I could never even imagine that we were going to get here one day and be able to use, like, you know, much better equipment, like the same caliber as the use in human medicine. And, well, and, and remember at the beginning of the pandemic, when everybody, human hospital was desperate for ventilators, we, we ended shared, up having, yeah, we, we shared our ventilators. Our ventilators. Yeah, to, to the hospitals up the street because they were desperate. And we said, well, we can probably we'll we'll figure out a way to share to help you guys out. So mm -hmm. th that's the quality of equipment that that you're that talking about is that we shared with the people up the street sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I would say is tell people what an anesthesia machine looks like. Like, I think those babies take up half an elevator when they're on with me. Is that, I mean, how big is it? Oh my goodness. So we have a couple of different mobile anesthesia machines. There's one that is attached to a gurney. So if we have an anesthetized patient that needs to go from medicine to CT or vice versa, for example, it's a long table that has an anesthesia machine that you can use different type of inhalants like isoflurane or sevoflurane. Um, oxygen tanks. Um, I don't know how to, like the measurement would be maybe like six feet long and three feet wide. I mean, they're pretty big. Yeah. Well, that's why I say that when you guys yeah. get on, on your way to CT, you're taking up half the elevator. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> he doesn't have the biggest elevators out there, folks. But um, th these, these are enormous pieces of equipment that we wheel around the hospital with uh, anesthetized patients on it. Um, yeah. to, so they can move from one, one piece of equipment or one room or one procedure to another one. Yeah. So, um, they, these are, these are big pieces of equipment that make our job, um, make us better veterinarians and also, um, help let us take care of pets better. Mm -hmm. So you kind of, uh, alluded to one of the important roles of a licensed veterinary technician, and that is um, you do a lot of anesthesia in your particular job. But yes. what other things um, do AMC technicians do? Oh, my goodness, we do everything. Um, so we obviously monitor anesthesia, we perform all kinds of, we place all kinds of different catheters, um, IV catheters from like a very short catheter that goes in one of the legs to a central line that goes from the main vessel in the neck. So a central line that, um, you know, is placed in the jugular vein. We also place the eye help teach residents place dialysis catheters, believe it or not. So that's kind of crazy that I am teaching a doctor how to do that. Um, we perform epidurals for orthopedic procedures. We monitor very sick patients in our ICU department, patients that are on the ventilator, patients that need special care. Um, I know a, a technician who is very good friend of mine, Karen, who performs dialysis, and I would love to one day learn how to do that. Um, I don't know, think we, it's going to be that easy to take over Karen's job. She no, loves it. no, and I don't think I want to, but I would love to learn from her because she's amazing at what she does. Um, but so, yeah, we do all kinds of different things, place urinary catheters to simple tasks, as, you know, taking up garbage, cleaning up after ourselves, stocking or placing orders for our departments. We do it all. And, and I think that's, you know, for those of you who haven't heard of veterinary technicians before, um, that that's one of the most important things about this job is that without veterinary technicians, I grind to a halt because I can do some things. I can't do hardly anything that <laughs> Jessica just described. I can take out trash. I can mop floors. But other <laughs> than that, all her skills are not my skills. And so veterinarians and veterinary technicians are really complementary to each other in, in terms of skill set. And, and so that's, I think that's what Jessica is talking about when she says that technicians have um, a bigger voice is it, it's not talking, it's, it's doing it, that you have a, you're allowed to have a bigger role than, and we use technicians better uh, than we did 20 years ago. Yes, definitely. So 
what's a typical, well, let me go back to anesthesia again. So a lot of people think participating in anesthesia where, you know, the patient is rendered immobile and sometimes you have to breathe for them in order to keep them under anesthesia safely. It, like, where did that come from? What would you, where did your interest in an anesthesia come from? Oh, that's funny because I was never interested in anesthesia. Anesthesia was very intimidating, very scary to me, knowing that I was the person keeping this patient alive was a huge responsibility and I did not want it. But when I came to the AMC and I applied for a job here, they offered me a position in the surgery department. And to be completely honest, that was the best decision I ever made. I was able to learn and master a skill that not a lot of people have and not a lot of people have the opportunity to do or to learn. And, and I have loved it ever since. So, so, so what would you tell someone who has been offered a job as a technician, but involves doing anesthesia? Give it a chance. Give it a chance because you never know where it's going to take you. I People come up to me all the time and say, I want to learn anesthesia. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. I'll teach you whatever you want to learn. And it's, it's, it's a great skill to have, especially nowadays. A lot of hospitals want technicians that know how to do anesthesia. So, so when so people say okay i think i know what anesthesia is you go to sleep but talk about what really happens what are you doing when you have a patient who's under anesthesia um so obviously they are immobilized they um you have to provide not just anesthesia so not just sedation you have to provide analgesia as well depending on the type of procedure that you're doing uh, you have to monitor their blood pressure, make sure that they don't become hypotensive. Um, you have to monitor their heart rate. So if their heart rate drops a lot, you have to intervene and give certain drugs in order for the patient to not, because they can die under anesthesia, right? So you have to do everything possible to make sure that all the vitals stay within normal levels. Um, so we monitor the temp the body temperature, the heart rate, the blood pressure, the saturation in their um, blood, make sure that they're getting oxygenated properly, make sure that the organs are getting perfused properly. So you have to keep your eyes on that patient the entire time that they're under. So I've seen Jessica anesthetize patients and she has a little clipboard and she's marking down stuff. How often about the heart rate, the respiratory rate, the temperature? Uh, so we mark things down every five minutes, but I am monitoring every second. So, so there's a, a patient under anesthesia at the Animal Medical Center has this giant grid chart that has dots and triangles and little symbols <laughs> all over it, because that helps the technician who's monitoring to keep track of what's going on with that patient. And so it's not like Jessica gives some drug and then walks off for a cup of coffee. She's there every second, making sure that the pet under anesthesia has a normal heart rate, a normal respiratory rate, yeah. a normal temperature. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure that people understand that. Well, since even if they've had anesthesia themselves, they don't see that going on. They don't see someone counting respiratory rate and counting pulse rate every five minutes, but that's how closely patients are monitored uh, here when, when they're under anesthesia. So that's, that's really, I think, should be reassuring to, mm -hmm. to people out there listening whose pets have had or may have anesthesia in the future. Mm -hmm. So what's a typical day like for you then? Well, we come in, I come in in the mornings. Um, we do rounds around 9 a.m. So we go over each and every patient that we're going to see as an appointment. Um, any cases that could potentially need procedures in the afternoon or the following day. Um, so we talk about them, we come up with plans. I facilitate with the appointments. I do blood drawers to submit to the lab, make sure that everything is, um, you know, the blood work is okay. And if it's not, then we have to do something about it. 
place IV catheters on patients that are being admitted for procedures. I sometimes do anesthesia for our patients who are going to have CT scans. Um, and then, you know, come up with protocols. If we have a procedure in the afternoon after appointments, get the patient ready, give them, you know, certain drugs. We give them things to um, help sedate them so they are calm and relaxed to avoid things like vomiting. So it's, I have to come up, depending on the procedure, depending on the patient, they get different drugs. And then towards like, once that's done, which is probably around four or five o'clock in the afternoon, I kind of sort of like clean up, do some stocking, uh, respond to emails, answer phone calls, talk to clients about their pets or any questions that they might have. Um, and then around 7, 7.30 o'clock, my day is done and then I go home. It, it, it's a typical long AMC day, um, but it's really rewarding work. Oh my God. I go home and I'm like, I am very satisfied when I go home at the end of the day. I really am. So you've done a lot of job hopping within the Animal Medical Center. Um, I, and, and you've seen some really interesting animals, I'm sure. Can you talk a little bit about the different animals you've had a chance to work with? Yeah. Um, so mainly cats and dogs, of course, but I've also helped with birds and rabbits, ferrets, I've done anesthesia on all of them. Um, years and years and years ago, I don't know if you remember, we had a, I don't remember if it was a tiger or a lion. I think it was like seven or eight months from the circuit that came in that ate a leash so we ended up having to do surgery on that patient it was the coolest thing ever and as an IR technician I was able to help with an aardvark an aardvark an ar yeah it's like people look at it and they think that it's an anteater oh they're different Ooh, that yeah, they're showing my ignorance yeah so does it have a long nose no, it doesn't. It has a shorter nose. That's, I think that's the difference between an anteater and an aardvark, that, they, that their nose is shorter than an anteater. So did you, did you have to place a breathing tube in that thing? We intubated it. Well, so I wasn't the primary person. Um, the people that brought it in were the, there was veterinarians that were helping with the anesthesia, but I was involved. I was able to help. I was able to like visualize everything that they were doing. So yeah, they had to intubate it and we hooked it up to the our anesthesia machine actually, which was uh, great. It, because some of these exotic animals, like they're animals and yes, the anatomy is sort of the same, but it's not really like it's sometimes no. they're, they're, they're weird and there's a ringer in there that, that makes your job really um, challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so what about how, to, why the job hopping? Why medicine to surgery, to IR, to ICU? What, what caused you I to guess move around? It's just, it's just where life has taken me. And there have been different opportunities that were offered to me at that time. I always wanted to learn different things. And it has all sort of come together at the end. Every single thing that I have learned from every department has helped me be where I am today. Um, so I have learned so much from every single place, every single department that I've worked in. So we just have a minute or so left. And I want to talk a little bit about your role as a technician preceptor. Mm -hmm. um, you've trained, I didn't realize you trained over a hundred licensed veterinary technicians once they've, they come to AMC. Is that yeah. right? I think so. <laughs> and, and so what do you train them to do? They, they are graduate, uh, LVTs. So why, why do they need you? Um, because not everybody has the knowledge that a person with experience of working and doing this every day has. Like, for example, me, when I was in school, I didn't want to do anesthesia. I thought anesthesia was just squeezing a little bad, but it's more than that. Um, so my main job is to just teach them about the different drugs, the different receptors that the drugs hit. Um, but I also like to teach them about how to be a service technician. It's not just about, you know, it's, we can do more than just doing patient stuff. We can communicate with clients. We can change a client's life by talking to them, explaining things to them. Um, 
that's a very satisfying part of my job. But when it comes to teaching students or teaching technicians, it's mainly about teaching them anesthesia and how to monitor it on a daily basis. I, I'm going to say that I bet you teach them more um, than just anesthesia. And I, I think your point about how to communicate with clients is really important. Sometimes, don't you think people talk to techs more readily than they would talk to me? You know, sometimes I think being the doctor is intimidating to the client. Probably. And I have, I have a lot of clients that call me before they call the doctors. Jessica, what do you think about this? And I'm like, well, have you spoken to Dr. So-and-so? They're like, yeah, but we want to get your opinion first. And I was like, well, this is my opinion, but you should definitely speak to the doctor. Yeah. See, see, that, yeah. that's exactly what I'm talking about. So we're almost out of time, but I want to give you a chance. What did I not ask you that you think our listeners should know? Um, maybe what I, I would love to, for everyone to know what IR is what interventional radiology is. Okay, go. And I just want to say that I love working in this apartment. I think it's a phenomenal place. I have the pleasure to work with the pioneers of veterinary inter of interventional radiology who are Dr. Weiss and Dr. Barent. I have learned so much from them. And we do amazing procedures here. We have the opportunity, we, thanks to them, we have been able to bring what, it's happening in human medicine over to veterinary medicine. I think we're changing and we, we're changing a lot of animals' lives for the better. Um, we're doing procedures like embolizing different kinds of tumors that are not able to be removed with surgery. Unfortunately, we are also able to fix a lot of urinary problems. Um, things that we weren't able to do before that animals didn't have an option to have perform like when, when it used to be like years ago, okay, there's nothing we can do for your pet. Nowadays, we're like, no, we can fix this, like a urinary obstruction of some sort. So I just want people to know that interventional radiology is an amazing department to work in, um, not to be intimidated and to come over anytime. And I will show them that all the different kinds of procedures that we perform here. Oh, what a great note and a happy note to end on. Thank you so much, Jessica Mejia, AMC's 2022 Vet Licensed Veterinary Technician of the Year for joining us today here on Ask the Vet. Thank you. Do you have a question about your pet's health? Just call and leave me a message and I'll answer your question next month on Ask the Vet. The number is 866-993-8267. We're going to take a short break, but when we come back, I'll have animal news stories. So stay right where you are. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Call now with your pet questions on Sirius XM Stars. Welcome back to Ask the Vet here on Sirius XM Stars Channel 109. It's time for the animal news. It's time for animal headlines. The biggest animal news from across the world. This is a good one. Last month during a local beauty pageant in Brazil, everyone from the participants to the audience got a sudden and unexpected surprise. A random dog just showed up and proceeded to walk down the catwalk with the crowd cheering him on. The dog seemed to bask in the glory and the adoration of the crowd as he strutted along. And although the dog's time on the stage was brief, his disappearance into the crowd was even more alluring. According to one spectator, the dog put on a real show. Even Jennifer Worowski, was named, who was named Miss Salmatis do Sul 2022, said that the dog kind of won the title in his own way. You can see a video clip of the pup's movement in the spotlight. Just Google dog on the runway in Brazil. Our second story today is kind of a homegrown story because uh, I'm just going to give a big happy birthday shout out to AMC's patient, Brownie, who turned 55 years old last week. Brownie is thought to be the oldest living dime store turtle in the country, perhaps even in the world. New York City artist Mimi Weisbord purchased Brownie at a Woolworths store in 1967. Remember Woolworths? It was great. They had that lunch counter. They had that bubbling orange stuff that your mother would never, never let you get when you wanted. You got to have grilled cheese and milk. So Brownie remained um, 
Mimi's companion through the years until she died in 2020. But fortunately, Brownie had a backup home and was taken in by another turtle lover and continues to live a wonderful life in New Jersey. This is the Brownie story has has a kind of a moral to the story in that pets like Brownie who can outlive their owners are at risk for being homeless if their owner dies. Turtles especially are abandoned or released into lakes and ponds at an increasing rate. And this is really a death sentence for a captive turtle that has never had to be out on its own. So Brownie is a great example of an AMC patient that's been well loved and cared for and a stark reminder that all families should have a good plan in place in writing to care for pets after their passing. If you want to see Brownie, the 55 year old AMC patient who's older than many of the doctors we have, Brownie has a webcam. It's www.watchbrownie, that's B-R-O-W-N-I-E dot com. Now, this story is a little unusual for me because it's about a horse. We don't do a lot of horse stories on Ask the Vet. But this story is about O'Malley, a handsome 35 year old Irish cob horse living in Scotland. He got stuck when his hind leg crashed through the wall of a septic tank. And according to the BBC, O'Malley's owner, Nikki Veen, feared the worst for her beloved horse. She said O'Malley had helped her through her own ordeals, including an ongoing recovery from a motorbike accident that happened 30 years ago. After a two hour rescue operation that involved the neighbors, volunteer firefighters and others, O'Malley came through literally unscathed. And you can see some incredible photos of O'Malley's rescue by Googling O'Malley the Horse Rescue. Our final story is about a study conducted by Chewy.com. They looked at over 2,000 pet owners to understand the degree to which pet parents prioritize their fur babies. There's some interesting and perhaps unexpected results from this survey. This first one, I don't think is surprising. Nearly three quarters of the respondents said they regularly put their pets needs before they, their own. Of course, the dog needs to go out in the middle of the night. You put on your sweatpants and your coat and you take them out. That's a perfect example. Two thirds of the respondents said they brought home another pet just because they thought their first pet was lonesome. And another third said they would consider getting their pet another pet. Half the respondents said they plan their free time around their pets and 40% say pets inf influence what vacations they take. A third of them said pets influence where they live. I would argue that that's actually the landlord's influence where they live because if you're a landlord and you don't have allow pets, then no one, those people can't live in your rental. And finally, three in 10 felt that having a pet makes them more prepared to have children in the future. So really interesting info uh, from Chewy.com. Now I'm gonna share some important pet health info with you. First of all, I think lots of people know that certain foods are toxic to pets, grapes, onions, raisins. But did you know that pennies minted after 1982 are potentially deadly if swallowed. Pennies used to be made of copper. That's why they're copper colored. But since 1993, the amount of copper it took to make pennies is costs more than a penny. Therefore, they've been made of zinc covered with copper since 1982. Zinc is very toxic because when the pet eats the penny, the stomach acid dissolves the zinc and releases it into the bloodstream. And that zinc in the bloodstream can cause what's called hemolytic anemia, and the blood cells explode and the pet becomes anemic. So it's important to play it safe by keeping your loose change out of your pet's reach. And if you expect your pet has swallowed a coin, especially a penny, you want to go to the veterinarian immediately because we can see those coins on an x-ray. And then we know that the pet needs emergency endoscopy to remove the coins. Now, this is November and November is National Pet Cancer Awareness Month. And according to the Veterinary Cancer Society, 
uh, the cause of death in 47% of dogs, particularly those over age 10, um, is cancer. And for a third of cats, the cause of death will be cancer. AMC recently celebrated the reopening of its updated state-of-the-art radiation facility with its brand new Electroversa HD linear accelerator. What a mouthful. This is the only one of its kind in veterinary medicine. The new technology this machine provides allows veterinarians to treat a diverse range of from simple to complex tumors and provides advanced types of treatments such as stereotactic radio surgery. There are many warning signs if your pet has cancer, they might have a lump or bump, that's obvious. But if they smell funny, have a discharge from their nose or their mouth, evidence of pain or changes in appetite or bathroom habits, all of those might indicate your pet has cancer. So in honor of National Pet Cancer Awareness Month, if you see any of these things, you need to take your pet to the veterinarian immediately um, to make sure that there's not something terribly wrong. Now, don't forget, I'm gonna answer pet health questions next, but you can call and leave me a voicemail message on our toll-free number, and I'll answer your questions on next month's Ask the Vet Show. Here's the number one more time. The number is 866-993-8267. And speaking of questions, let's answer questions from our listeners. Our first call comes from Milo. I have a question about my dog, Milo. Um, Milo is, has had this problem once before, but he has a problem recently. He's almost three where he seems constantly hungry all the time out of like, it just happened out of nowhere. And he's just, this doesn't seem right. And it happened once before. And I just was wondering if it could be some type of parasite or some type of issue that needs to be treated by the vet. Thank you. So Milo's owner is worried because Milo is hungry all the time. And that's an unusual complaint from a dog owner. Cats very commonly become hyperthyroid, meaning their thyroid is overactive. And those cats eat up a storm and lose weight like crazy. So there are some diseases in, cat, in dogs that can cause them to be very hungry. Dogs can be hyperthyroid. It's quite rare but it's associated with a thyroid tumor. So I think Milo needs to see his veterinarian. Another disorder that we see that makes dogs really hungry is a disease called Cushing's disease. And that is an, either an overactive pituitary gland or overactive adrenal glands. The other thing that matters too is if Milo's really hungry and is losing weight, that suggests there might be a thyroid problem. And if Milo is really hungry and gaining weight, that's more common for Cushing's disease. So I think Milo needs, you know, a, a nose to toes evaluation, including weighing him and seeing if he's losing weight or gaining weight. The other thing to consider is that Milo is just looking for attention and that if he acts hungry and throws his bowl around the kitchen, you're going to pay attention to him. And so maybe Milo just needs a little bit more TLC, a little more ball throwing and a couple extra walks. And it's not that he's hungry, but he just craves your love and attention. So I hope Milo's not got a big problem. And thanks to his owner for calling us here on Ask the Vet. Our next caller is Sabrina. Hi, my name is Sabrina. Um, my question is regarding raw food diets. I've fed both non-raw and currently feeding raw food and see a tremendous progress and benefits, especially in working dogs. So I'm looking to find out your thoughts. I'm located in Westchester County, New York. I'm also a licensed veterinary technician. Thank you so much. Sabrina, what a great call because this is Technician Day on uh, Ask the Vet, and we just had Jessica Mejia, AMC's 2022 Technician of the Year on. Um, so you know how much uh, we at AMC value our technicians. I'm not, however, as wild about raw food diets as I am about technicians. Um, we cook food, specifically protein. Raw carrots is fine. You know, raw grains are fine. I, I'm specifically talking about raw protein sources when I'm not that happy about raw food diets. 
And we cook protein because protein can carry microbes, different types of bacteria or other parasites that might make your dog sick, that might also make the people in the household sick. So my concern about raw food diets is protecting the health of my animal patients and their human owners. But I'm not a nutrition expert. Uh, and a lot of what I know about nutrition has been uh, taught to me by Dr. Lisa Weath. And it just happens that on last month's episode of Ask the Vet, we had Dr. Lisa Weath as our guest. She's a board certified nutritionist. So if you go to www.amcny.org and put in the search bar, Ask the Vet, you simply want to click on episode 21 and you can hear Lisa Weiss, board certified nutrition opinion about raw food diets. Dr. Weiss was also uh, last summer um, part of the USDAN Institute's um, education series for pet owners. And she gave an evening talk, which has been recorded. And her evening talk about um, pet food basics can be found on AMC's website simply by putting pet food basics in the search bar at www.amcny.org. And you can hear from the horse's mouth exactly um, the nutrition opinion of raw food diets for dogs and cats. Thanks so much, Sabrina, for that call. And I hope you enjoy the podcast and the video recording of our education event. Thanks so much to all our callers uh, for calling in those questions. Let me give you that toll-free number one more time, 866-993-8267. We love listener calls here on Ask the Vet. So now we'll take a short break. And when we come back, I'm going to talk about what's happening at AMC's USDAN Institute. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Call now with your pet questions on Sirius XM Stars. Welcome back to Ask the Vet here on Sirius XM Stars Channel 109. I'm hoping that pet parents everywhere will take advantage of all the timely, relevant, and free offerings of the USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education. First of all, we have a free pet health library, which is a user-friendly platform with the most accurate, trustworthy pet health information. All content in the pet health library has been verified by veterinary experts at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. And you simply need to look in the pet health library, which is on the top ribbon of amcny.org. You click on that and then all the different topics are alphabetical. So easy for you to find what you're looking for, you know, all the way from leptospirosis to zoonotic diseases. We also have a free weekly newsletter packed with timely pet health information that you can sign up to receive by email. And then as I talked about with our listener, we host a free virtual and monthly pet health event every month all year round. If you can't attend the event you're interested in uh, live or virtually, you can also stream all the health events after they've occurred because we have them archived uh, on our website. And that also includes AMC's Animal Lovers Book Club videos, which are also housed on AMC's websites. If you simply go to amcny.org and put events in the search bar, that page will come right up. Our next used and virtual event is going to be one that everyone is going to want to see. Title, Vision Loss in Dogs and Cats. 